pray. Father, we pray now that as we open the word, you'd open our hearts, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Don't you wish that Laura would get excited? Can I get a witness on that? If you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Last week we started a journey through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we started at the end of the book, and we wrapped the entire series around really one verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And the whole argument that I think, or part of the argument that the book of 1 Corinthians is making is that when you forget or can't remember or don't know who you are in Jesus Christ, it doesn't go well. And the story of the church at Corinth is the story of a people of God that no sooner had the Apostle Paul left that city, they began to experience difficulty so that the Apostle Paul had to write them not one, not two, but four letters. Did you know that? There are, we have two of them, First and Second Corinthians, and we have two more mentioned in both of those letters. And in fact, Paul called one of those letters the severe letter. So if you read 1st and 2nd Corinthians and you think they're difficult, I wonder what the severe letter would be like. So here Paul is writing to this church, and I want us to begin, if you will, in chapter 1, and let's begin with the introduction all the way down to verse 9. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you have been enriched, made rich in Him, in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the unveiling, the revelation, the apocalypsis of Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end blameless or guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Amen? God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I meet people all the time who have no clue who they are. And those who don't know who they are sometimes adopt an identity. So when I first moved here in 1995, you people who live near this church building will remember that there was a guy that used to walk up and down Gallatin Road and particularly in front of the Kroger down here who dressed like, talked like, walked like Elvis Presley. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And uh, he is no longer um, around and with us, but for years he would dye his hair jet black had it like this, you know, however Elvis would do that. How many of you are Elvis fans? I'm, don't, okay, okay. I'm, that's, that's great. And he would be, he, and I guess every time I saw him, I thought, I wonder if he really knows who he is. If I walked up to him and said, hey man, do you know who you are? If he would respond with his real name or Elvis. Now you might think that's silly, to be honest with you, but how many People live their entire life never really knowing who they are. In fact, life is one of those journeys where you're trying to figure out who you are. And, and let me tell you what most of us do. We take a person, a place, or an event, and we wrap our whole identity around that person, place, or event. And most of the time when that happens, 
it doesn't go well. So let me give you an example. I meet a person that has wrapped their whole life around a failure. So their identity of who they think they are is wrapped around a failure. Maybe a broken marriage, maybe a lost job, maybe a failure somewhere in their life. And when you walk up to them and ask them who they are, they'll say, well, I was born on such and such a date. This is my name. But before too long, in that conversation, they will begin to rehearse that great failure. Something happened to me, something I did, something that something someone did to me and they'll take that and that becomes their whole identity and then it can happen with success it can happen with success that is somebody can take a success in their life and they can say well this is who I am and and they wrap their whole life around this that's why sometimes a success in the past becomes all that you live for you keep trying to repeat that moment and it doesn't happen. So whether it's failure or success, the great danger in finding out and discovering who we are outside of Jesus Christ is, is, is dangerous. Because guess what? God has more for you than your failures, and He has more for you than your successes. All of us will fail. Anybody in the house never, ever failed. All of us have failed. And so here's what I want you to see. Paul begins this letter by a long introduction. We don't introduce letters like this. We, we, if we write a letter or an email, we say, Dear so-and-so, and we send an email. Or we don't even say, Dear so-and-so. But here we have nine verses of introduction that before he gets into all the issues that this church is dealing with, he wants them to rem be reminded of who they are in Jesus Christ. And so let me pose this question before we dive in. Do you know who you are? Is your identity secure in who Jesus says that you are? Well, let's begin. I want you to look at verses 1, 2, and 3. The Bible tells us that we have our identity in Christ. And then he tells us that we have resources in Christ, and then he finishes out by telling us that we are sustained by Christ. So look at what it says in the first three verses. Look at these phrases that he used. He says that we are called by the will of God. He says this about himself. He says that I was called to be an apostle. He notices that I have a brother, Sosthenes, which means that he was not called to be a lone ranger, but he was called in the body of Christ with other fellow believers. And then he goes on, we are the church of God. We have been made sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are called to be saint. In fact, did you know that all of you are, if you're in Christ Jesus, you're already a saint. We don't have to wait to beify you or deify you, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, did you know that you're a saint? Can you do that? And then turn back to him and say, you don't look like much of one. Amen? And then notice how he ends this introduction in verse 3. Grace and peace. Now in these three verses, all Paul is trying to do through what he says about himself and what he says to this church is to remind them of who they are in Jesus Christ. The one who has the right to identify who you are is none other than Jesus Christ. Not your mama. Not your daddy, not your grandparents, not your past, not your failures, not your successes, not anything future, past or present. The one who has every right, the authority to tell you who you are is none other than the person of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? In fact, let me just summarize. Listen to this. Here's who we are in Christ. We are called. We are set apart. We are brothers and sisters. We are the church. We have been sanctified. We have been graced. And we are at peace. And all of that is in the person of Jesus Christ. Notice the second thing, and I want you to know this is good. 
Notice he says that in Christ, in verse 4 and 5, he says in Jesus that we have our identity in Him, we have been made rich, that because He is rich, we have been enriched. I love that. He, he says that we have been enriched, uh, made rich by everything that God has. Rich. So think about this. The Bible talks about the riches of God. How rich is God? I heard the other day that uh, Bezos is uh, the guy that owns Amazon, worth $127 billion, with a B. I'd be glad to live on less than 1% of that, wouldn't you? Amen? That's rich. But compared to God, he's a pauper. The Bible talks about God being rich all the time. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3-11 through 11 talks about how rich God is toward us in His grace. Romans 11.33 says that, oh, the depths of the riches of His grace. Ephesians 3.16 says that He has the riches of His glory. And Colossians 1.27 says that He has the riches of His glory that He has made known to us in Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is saying to this church is, not only does Jesus have the right to tell you who you are and to remind you who you are in Him, but He has every resource that you need to be what He says that you are. Did you get that? Because I know what you're thinking. Well, I don't feel called. I don't feel sanctified. I don't even feel French fried. I don't even feel justified. I don't even feel put together. I barely got here today. I, I don't. My life is wrecked, ruined. There's tattered, torn, all that stuff. How can, in the world can I be what God wants me to be in Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says that He has given you everything you need to be who He said you are. What does this say? Well, notice what it says. It says that we have been received and saved in Jesus Christ. We have grace. We have speech. Notice it says we have been made rich in speech. We've been made rich in knowledge. And then he goes on to say, he said, so that... He has resourced you in every way so that He has gifted you so that you don't lack any gift. Now get this. God has given you salvation, grace, what comes out of your mouth, which is really what's in your heart, and He has given you every gift you need in order to be what He wants you to be in Christ. Now let me tell you what kind of gift I think He's talking about here. He's, he's talking not about you get in a present, like at Christmas, he's talking about daily gifts of grace. Does anybody need daily gifts of grace? I needed a daily gift, gift of grace this morning at 5 o'clock. I'm the principal. I was telling Avonlea this. She uh, stayed all night at the house last night. So I got up this morning and she said, Paul, Paul, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm kind of like the principal of Inglewood Baptist Church. I have to go up and make sure the streets are okay because all the boys, so all the boys and girls can go to, to church school. Oh. So I got up here. I, you know, but I didn't want to get out. Did you know that it was cold this morning? But God, now you might be thinking this is silly, but God gave me the resources and, the, and that small gift of grace even for something as trite as just getting in the car, doing my responsibility, then getting the word out, yes, for everybody and anybody who can make it, we're going to have church. Well, think about what happens when it comes to the big stuff. Jesus says that I am a brother and sister in Christ, that I have been saved and justified by Him. Jesus says that I have been graced, I'm at peace. And you're thinking, well, I don't feel that way. I, I don't. And then He comes right along this and He said, I want to remind you in verse 4 and 5 that not only has He identified who you are, but He is rich toward you so that you don't lack in anything that He wants to give you. You don't lack in any grace that you need. You don't lack in any gift that you could ever possibly need. And even what comes out of your mouth will really come out of your heart. He has made you rich in every way. Every way. 
rich. Look at the final thing. Look, if you will, and I love this in verses 8 and 9. Paul says that he has sustained us. So, so, so get this. Look, if you will, in verse 8 and 9, and I want to reread this. This is really good. He says, Who will sustain you to the end? Blameless, guiltless. God is faithful. He will do this. So, so think with me. Jesus identifies who we are. That we are graced, we are forgiven, we are at peace, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we have each other, we have been sanctified, set apart. And any and every resource that you, would, you and I would ever need to be what He says, he, He's been rich toward us. He's been rich toward us, rich in grace, rich in peace. It just, it just keeps coming. God's bank account never runs out. There is never, an, you never get an insufficient funds for what God wants to give you in the spiritual dimension of your walk with Jesus. He will give you every resource you need. And sometimes, don't you wish He'd give you more, but sometimes He gives you just enough daily bread. And then you know what he says? He goes, this Jesus will not only tell you and remind you who you are, this Jesus will not only resource you to be what he wants you to be, but our Savior will sustain you. Sustain you. Sustain you how and when. Notice what it says. We are sustained, the latter part of verse 7, we are sustained while we wait for Jesus. While we wait for Jesus. How many of you believe that Jesus is returning? I do. All of us do. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but if you're like me, I'm like the Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation, and at the end of it, you know what he says? After, he re after God reveals to him all this stuff about Revelation, you know what he says? Even so, come right now. Come on, Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But what happens when you're waiting on Jesus to come at the spiritual bus stop? While you're waiting for this to come and to happen. You see, the Bible talks about two days of the Lord. You will notice in your Bible that the interpreters have done us a favor. Sometimes they'll talk about the day of the Lord, capital D. That is the day. That's the day when Jesus comes back. We see Him. We, we see Him and He catches us away. But then there's the smaller day of the Lord. It's your day, it's my day, it's that day of Hebrews 9.27. It's appointed unto a person once to die and then the judgment. But whether we are waiting for the day to come, and wouldn't it be great to be alive when the day comes, when we see Him face to face, and we are caught up with Him in the clouds to be with Him in glory forever, whether it's that day or whether it's a lowercase day when God calls you home, Number one, you better be ready. But while you're waiting on that to happen, guess what? God sustains you. God sustains you while you're waiting for the revelation, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Look at your text in verses 7, 8, and 9. The word revelation here means, it comes from the word apocalypse. It literally means to pull back the curtain. Now, you know, many times I've baptized folks right up there. Several, several times. Last year and, and, and uh, soon this year. And I'm back there and we've had prayer, and, but the curtain's drawn. And all of a sudden, somebody pulls the curtain cord and there's the, uh, we have an apocalypse. And there it is. The curtain's been pulled back. Well, until the curtain, listen, until the curtain is pulled back, 
on this life, the Lord will sustain you while you wait. Because you know what can happen to a believer? What can happen to a believer is what the Bible says can happen to a believer, and especially what happens to an unbeliever. While you're waiting, I don't think he's ever going to show up. He's, I don't think he's going to show up. I don't think he's coming. And I guess since he's not coming, what I'll do is I'll just go live however I want to live. I'll redefine who I am. Listen, don't buy that argument. Because the Lord is coming. He will come like a thief in the night. He will come unannounced. And he will come... And he will come and he will wrap things up. And in the meantime, you know what he will do? He will give you the patience to wait until the coming of the Lord. Look what else it says. It says we're sustained until the end. Do you see that? We're sustained until the end. This is The word end is a very interesting word. It's, the root word is telos, which means, now listen, which means something has a purpose. This is incredibly important. So many people live their lives and they don't think their life has any purpose. And here's the good news about knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. God has a purpose. His purpose is to form Himself in you. And He will use whatever means necessary, not only the means of grace, preaching, prayer, all these things we use here at church, but He will take the sandpaper of even what you think is hell, and He will sand you off because He has a purpose. You're not just waiting for Christ willy-nilly. He says He's not only going to sustain you until Jesus comes back, but He's going to sustain you until the very purposed end that He has for your life. I love that. He'll sustain you. Look what else it says. He'll sustain you blameless, guiltless. That is, that if you're in Jesus Christ, not only does He say who you are, not only does He resource you to be who He says that you are in Christ, and as He sustains you until Christ comes back to the very purpose that He has for your life, here's the good news is that He will do so and He will treat you as if you are blameless in Christ. I have good news for you. It's preceded by bad news for you. Bad news for you and me is that all of us are messed up, jacked up, broken up, cracked up. We are sinners, sinners bound to hell under the wrath and judgment of God. God and the good news is is that in Jesus Christ he has taken those kinds of sinners and imputed his righteousness to them so that when Jesus looks at you he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus Christ so that when he comes you and I stand blameless guilt less because of who we are in Jesus Christ Look what else it says in verse 9. God is faithful. What is more faithful, or who is more faithful than God? God can sustain you because He's faithful. Aren't you glad that God never takes a day off? How many of you need it? I need a day off. God's made you that way. But guess what? God never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never takes a day off. He doesn't need a sabbatical. He doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't need a furlough. He doesn't need time down. He is always and forever faithful. And notice the latter, very last thing in verse 9. He says, and he's done all of this in the fellowship that we have in Jesus Christ. Now let me wrap all this up. Now listen. Paul is going to say some very hard things to this church. I mean, he's going to take him to the woodshed. He is going to be really biting sometimes to this church. Sometimes when I read 1 Corinthians and then go into 2 Corinthians, I mean, it, it's all you can do to get through it because you know that everything he said to them, he really needs to say to me. 
at some level. And yet, now listen, when he starts, he doesn't first start in on them. You know what he does in these first nine verses? He just reminds them. Dear brothers and sisters at the church of Corinth, let me remind you who you are. Jesus says who you are. You are graced. You are at peace. You're sanctified. You've been saved. You've been set apart. You've been called. And you've got brothers and sisters like Sosthenes who are with you. He has a particular task for you. Paul says, I'm an apostle. But God has a plan and purpose for every one of you. And then he says, by the way, not only do I have the right to define who you are, but I'm going to give you every resource that you need to do and to be what I say you are. And then while you're doing that, I'm going to sustain you. I will uphold you every step of the way. I was reading David Powelson's comment on this. David Powelson is a great... Bible commentator. And let me summarize what Paul is saying by this. Listen very carefully. Your true identity in Christ is who God says you are. You will never discover who you are by looking inside yourself or listening to the world outside yourself. Why? Because the Lord gets the first word on who you are in Jesus Christ. He gets the daily word on who you are because you live before His face every day. And Jesus gets the final word on who you are because one day when you stand before Him, He will do the ultimate comprehensive review of your life in Jesus Christ. Jesus gets the first word who you are. Jesus gets the daily word who you are. And Jesus gets the final word in who you are. A couple of years ago I was talking to a person who had had a tragic thing happen to them growing up. And I talk to people like this all the time, and I'm not going to go into all the details of this. And uh, because of what had happened to him growing up, he had actually perpetuated what had happened to him. It was some form of abuse. And now this abuser had become, this abused had become the abuser. And he spent most of his young adult life and even his adult life trying to relinquish and free himself from this great wickedness. And then he came into the preaching of the gospel and it began to just really wreck his world. He, he began to hear things like what you've heard this morning, that Jesus has something to say about who you are, that he has grace for the sinner. He, 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 he can sustain us. He can resource us. And I will never forget, he, he began to come to the church that I pastored and he began to sit about halfway back. Here's a lost man. Here's a man who has been respected in the community. And for week after week, he would sit under the relentless preaching of the Word of God that was diagnosing his condition and who he was. And I will never forget, I get this call one day in my office and he says, I want to see you. I want to see you. And I thought, uh-oh, here, what's, I'm, I, he was, he was known in the community as kind of a curmudgeon. You ever met a curmudgeon? And so I'm thinking, I braced myself, I put on my spiritual flak jacket, you know what I'm talking about. I went over to his house, I walk into his house, his wife greets me at the door, I walk into the living room, and here's a man who had been, uh, put up a veneer, he had tried to re-identify himself, and yet this great wickedness kept telling him, you are the abused, and now that you're the abuser, there's no hope for you. But he had been sitting under the preaching of the word, he had been loved by the people of God, and now he's called the pastor. And I go in and I say, called him by name, and I said, sir, how can I help you? 
That's all I got out. And that's, he didn't even get anything out. Before I know it, I'm sitting in a chair, he's sitting there, and he lunges forward onto his knees, onto the uh, thing where you put your feet, and he is on his face, weeping. Weeping. You know, I make a lot of people cry, not on purpose. <laughs> Sometimes I just, hey, how you doing? This is, the floodgates open up. I didn't mean to do that, but on this occasion, all I did is I knocked on the door. He greeted me. I said, how can I help you? And now, the next thing I know, he's on his knees. He's weeping his eyes out. When he got his composure, he sat back up, and I called him my name again. I said, how can I help you? And he began to unfold not only how he had been abused, but now how that had translated into him being the abuser. And he said, for all my life, and this he's probably in his early 60s, he said, for all my life, I have told myself who I am by my experience to me, by the experience from me. And what you're telling me is that God has something different to say about me. I said, yes. And so right there in his living room, I had brought my trusty New Testament in my pocket. I just began to preach to him the gospel about how Jesus loves to take broken sinners and to redefine them and to have the first word and the daily word and ultimately the final word about who they are. And right there in his living room on his knees he trusted Christ as God opened his heart and ripped out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh and changed it. What a delight it was. What a delight it was to not only be a spiritual midwife to see that happen but what a delight it was to go through the waters of baptism with him and what a delight it was for him to go to the people he had abused and beg for their forgiveness and they gave it to him. Brothers and sisters, only God can do that when he redefines and tells you who you are in him. Let's pray. Father, you have the first word, you have the daily word, and you will have the final word in who we are. And Lord, I know that in this room there are those who have taken some of their failures, some of their successes, all of our sin. And the temptation is for us to wrap our identity around that thing, that person, place, that thing that binds us. And Lord Jesus, here you come along with your cross and your grace and your resurrection that you have conquered sin and that your blood has covered every person who would ever believe. And so, Father, I pray this morning that there would be people who would be set free and to begin the process of redefining who they are by what you say about them. That they're saved and set apart and called and there's a purpose and you're sustaining them and you are resourcing all of us to be what you want us to be in Christ. Father, help us to repent. Help us to turn away from everything that we would seek consolation in, whether it be failure or success, and help us to turn to Christ and find ourselves totally in you.